All right, we're back in the saddle here. Today we're going to talk about deriving some arc trig functions or some inverse trig functions. And uh, we're going to kind of warm up today. We're just going to review what these graphs look like, uh, go over some particular properties like their domains, their ranges, how to evaluate them, and then we'll go over some of the derivative rules and whatnot. Um, and, and basically, today, we're, by the time we're done with today's lesson, we're going to be able to, you know, pick a random point on one of these graphs. You know, maybe, maybe this particular point, we're going to be able to write the equation of that tangent line by the time we figure out its slope and so forth. Um, we're going to analyze each graph um, individually on these next couple of slides. But I just wanted to clarify with these pictures that uh, these are not horizontal asymptotes for an arc sine and and arc cosine. I think they're, they're just there for boundaries uh, to kind of show you where the graph, uh, you know, how high it runs up to and so forth. But by the time you do get to tangent, we do have the really nice horizontal asymptotes at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. Okay, so the first time we ever introduced you to the graph of inverse sine or arc sine, what we did is we, we said we're going to take all of the x values and all of the y values for the sine curve and flip-flop them. And so what you'll notice is we now have our y-axis labeled in terms of pi, and uh, you know our x-axis is just labeled in terms of regular whole numbers and so forth. And we started flipping all those points. Well, the problem is that curve started to look like this. Um, let's see. It would have done you know, a little job like that and kind of swam this way. But what you'll notice is it definitely does not pass the vertical line test. So we had to put some restrictions on it. We said we're not going to let it go any higher than pi over 2. We're not going to let it go any lower than negative pi over 2. And as long as we stay within that window, we've got ourselves a function. So we had to restrict the domain of sine so that arc sine became a function. And uh, according to this picture here, uh, the domain of arc sine is going to be from negative 1 to 1 on the x-axis, and the range is going to be from negative pi over 2 all the way up to positive pi over 2. Now, before we evaluate a couple of these values here, I want to just go over some terminology. You know, back in the day, if I asked you for the sine of pi over 4, you would have hopefully told me it was radical 2 over 2. Now, when pi over 4 is your x value, it represents an angle. All right, and the radical two over two is your y value, and we j I just refer to that as the value. Okay, so we've got our angles and we're, we've got our values. It's very important to keep those straight. So when we start talking about like inverse sine, those two rascals are going to switch. The x and y values switch. So now I might ask you for, you know, what's the arc sine of radical two over two? And your answer to me is now going to be an angle. Now the angle is the y value, and so you would say an angle of pi over four. If I wanted um, arc sine, whoops, handwriting's getting a little crazy here, of one half, uh, we're looking for an angle of pi over six, okay? Now I could have said the same question, instead of arc, I could have just said the inverse symbol there, and I'd still get the same answer of pi over six. And then just watch out for the crazy negative values. If it's negative one half, look at what your graph's telling you. And negative one half, the corresponding uh, value on the curve is a negative angle right here. And this negative angle that it corresponds to is negative pi over six. Uh, sometimes people are tempted to give me an answer of like 7 pi over 6 or 11 pi over 6, and I say that those angles simply do not exist in this restricted range that we've got here for ourselves. All right, real quick here, our domain is just like the last picture from negative 1 to 1, um, but our range for this particular function is from 0 to pi. If we went any higher than pi, it would then begin to fail the vertical line test and not be a function anymore. Um, so as far as evaluating, let's do arc cosine of 1 half. So again, I'm looking for an angle. Tell me which angle corresponds to the 1 half right here. Um, looks like an angle of 60 degrees, which is pi over 3. If The tricky one here is if we want to do arc cosine of negative 1 half, take a look at your picture, go straight up from the negative 1 half, and ask yourself, what's that angle right there? Well, you'll notice it's an angle that's a little bit bigger than pi over 2, but certainly smaller than pi. 60 degrees is his reference angle, so I'm really referring to 120. And if you convert 120 to radians, we've now got ourselves 2 pi over 3. Um, if we wanted arc cosine of, let's say, 1, right there is your x value of 1, the angle is 0. If we wanted arc cosine of negative 1, the corresponding angle would be pi. 
Now, my favorite uh, inverse trig graph by a mile is the arc tangent graph, and I do believe it's the most popular one on the AP exam. I think if you're going to really be an expert on just one of these three, but I, you know, I hope you're an expert on all three of them. But if you had to pick just one, I would recommend arc tangent. Um, our domain is the set of all real numbers. In other words, we're going from negative infinity to positive infinity in the x direction. Our range is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, non-inclusive. It's what we call an open interval because the graph never actually reaches a height of pi over 2. It just approaches it. And with that being said, there are some fun limit questions that apply to this graph. We could ask ourselves, you know, what's the limit as x approaches infinity? for this particular function. And we would say, well, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the curve approaches an intended height of pi over 2. And on the flip side, the limit as x approaches negative infinity in the far left direction, graph is approaching a height of negative pi over 2. So those are some fun limit questions. Um, the most popular one to evaluate and I'm going to choose to write it like this. Um, I certainly could have said what's arc tangent of 1. It's the same way of asking, the, you know, or two different ways of asking the same question, I should say. And again, we've got a value of 1, and I'm looking for the corresponding angle, and it looks like an angle of pi over 4. Now, on the flip side of that, what's the inverse tan of negative 1? So if the x value is negative 1, what's my angle? You notice the corresponding angle right here is a negative angle. It's somewhere small. It's smaller than 0, but bigger than negative pi over 2. And the angle is negative pi over 4. All right, so I've got three new rules for you. We're actually ready to do some calculus right now. This is our first calculus moment of the video. And uh, my first rule is for how to find the derivative of the arc sine of u. Okay? And what we're going to do for this particular rule, it's an ugly rule, um, but it says it's the derivative of u divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared. All right? Certainly not the prettiest rule we've ever seen, but a uh, little bit of practice. We'll have it down pat. Um, you're going to really like the second one because it's almost virtually the same thing. Arc cosine of some function u. It's All we're going to do differently is we're going to negate our du, and we still have that same radical on the bottom. And then the third one is, again, the one that I think shows up most frequently on the AP exam, and that's the derivative of our tangent of u. And a little friendlier, it's going to be the derivative of u divided by 1 plus u squared. So we threw the radical away, and we changed our minus sign to a plus sign. And those are the three rules that we're going to focus on today. We're going to practice using them and commit them to memory, and they'll show up certainly on our bite-sized quizzes on Monday. Okay, our first basic example, I want you to consider the function y equals the arc sine of 2x. And so when I say u, I'm really referring to the 2x right here. And the derivative we put on the last screen says I need my the derivative of u divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared. And of course, if you wanted to, depending on what the multiple choices looked like, you may want to rewrite it as 1 minus 4x squared. Uh, but certainly they're both equivalent, and I would accept both of them. Uh, number two, again, just a real basic one to kind of get, get our feel, get our feet underneath us. Our tangent of 3x. And uh, our rule says, well, that's the 3x is my u. So the derivative is the derivative of u divided by 1 plus the u value squared, and of course we could square that out and turn it into 9x squared. All right, keep going. We'll kind of try to challenge you a little bit more here. Let's try arc cosine of radical x. And there's a lot of times they won't put parentheses around it, but I always like to just to kind of emphasize the fact that my u is the square root of x or x to the 1 half. So as I go through my derivative, I need to negate my du. So it's negative 1 half x to the negative 1 half power all over radical 1 minus u squared. So we'll clean that up just a touch. I'm going to say negative 1 all over, and I'm going to send this 2 to the denominator. I'm going to send my x to the denominator. And then I already have the big radical waiting on the bottom, so 1 minus x by the time I square it. And, um, you know, that's probably how I would leave my answer. And let's see if we can get one more in on this page before we graduate to something else. Um, let's make that black. Okay, y equals the arc tangent of e to the 2x power. So we're going to get to use our exponential rule here. As I derive my u, 
it's going to be e to the u times du. And then on the bottom, we've got 1 plus my u squared. Clean this up just a touch. 2e to the 2x all over 1 plus. Now, if I square that, so e to the 2x times itself says I would add those exponents and get e to the 4x, just like that. All right, I got a couple of monsters here for you to finish uh, uh, up our lesson with tonight. And this first one is I want you to look at the function arc sine of x plus x radical 1 minus x squared. Okay, and uh, I've got really two big goals here as we take this guy's derivative is I, obviously I want to be able to, you know, practice our new rule and I want to go over, you know, and of course you see product rule in here, but it also involves a lot of, you know, algebraic work as we clean it up. And I think that's something that we could really, you know, could really help us out. So I encourage you, if you're feeling pretty confident, this is an outstanding time to hit that pause button and try this derivative on your own and try to clean it up the best you can. And, um, and then come on back and hit play and see if we're on the same page, see if we agree. All right, welcome back. Uh, like we hinted at, we are going to do some product rule right in there. So um, my derivative is going to use my rule on this first term, my new rule for today. And my u is just the x, so I've got my du all over radical 1 minus u squared. Pretty straightforward. And then we're going to run through our product rule. So I've got the first times the derivative of the second. And negative 1 halves my new exponent. Negative 2x is the derivative of the inner. Okay, Plus the second times the derivative of the first, which is a 1. Okay, cleaning this bear up just a touch. I'm going to try to write uh, each term as a fraction so that I can get rid of the negative exponents. Um, I did think that uh, this 1 half killed that 2. So I ended up with negative x squared as my numerator, and I had the radical 1 minus x squared on the bottom, and then the last term was radical 1 minus x squared all over 1. Now what I want to do is I want to try to create a common denominator so I can add all of these rascals together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this last one by radical 1 minus x squared all over itself. At this point, I've created common denominators and I'm ready to combine everything. Um, now, by the time I multiplied this term by this term, the radicals would cancel, and I would strictly have 1 minus x squared after I multiplied those two guys together. So my derivative says, combine all three into one fraction, and my numerators are, I've got 1 minus x squared plus 1 minus x squared. And let's see, that's going to give me 2 minus 2x squared all over radical 1 minus x squared. And what I'm going to do from there is just a real subtle trick. I'm going to factor out the 2. So it's 2 quantity 1 minus x squared. And believe it or not, because I've got 1 minus x squared to the 1 half on the bottom, I can cancel those rascals. In other words, I've got an exponent of 1. I'm going to subtract the exponents and just get 2 um, radical 1 minus x squared, or 1 minus x squared to the 1 half, and that's my final answer. Look at how clean that is compared to where we were just a few minutes ago. All right, our last one for the night, we're going to go try to find some points of inflection. In other words, we're going to try to figure out where this curve changes concavity, and the function I'm referring to is arc tan of x all squared. So it's not the x that's getting squared, it's the entire function arc tan of x getting squared. And we're going to use a lot of calculator here. And, um, and I want you to get, go get yours and have it handy. And I think some of, we're going to just polish up some of our calculator skills. So my game plan here, um, just kind of setting the table, is I'm going to try to find my second derivative. I'm going to then set it equal to zero, get my critical points. And then I'm going to construct a sign chart to prove that the second derivative actually changes signs, therefore confirming my points of inflection. So my first derivative is going to be some nice chain rule, 2 times the inner function, now raised to the first power. And then I'm going to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is du over 1 plus u squared. Looks just like that. Um, if you want to rewrite it, it would be 2 arc tangent of x all over 1 plus x squared. And I know I've really done, you know, been hating on the uh, quotient rule, but this is a time where I think I'm going to use it. Really, I think, you know, trying to avoid it really didn't help me at all. So I just went, uh, we're going to do low d high. And uh, deriving the high is going to give me a 2 all over 1 plus x squared. Minus high d low. And deriving the low gives me 2x all over the low squared. 
all right? And, uh, you know, let's clean it up maybe just a touch. Look how nice these two radicals canceled. And so my second derivative is simply uh, 2 minus 4x arctangent of x all over 1 plus x squared quantity squared. All right. Now, as I sec set this second derivative equal to 0, I'm going to cross multiply, and the denominator fades away once again, multiplying it by 0. So really, all I'm doing is I'm setting my numerator equal to 0. And I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to grab my calculator now, because that's such an ugly rascal. And what I'm going to do is, you can see right here that I have entered my numerator into my calculator, into the y equals. Notice it, um, the calculator doesn't print arctan, it prints tangent inverse of x. It's the same thing. And then what I'm going to do is I did zoom standard, but then uh, I also did a zoom in after I did zoom standard. And so if I'm going too fast, good time to hit the pause button here on the video and just make sure that you're keeping up with your calculator. And, um, and I've got this nice picture here. And again, just remind yourself, this is a picture of the second derivative. It's not a picture of the original function. And uh, I want to really see where it equals zero. And so it looks like I've got two zeros right here. And to get those precise values, I'm not going to estimate them. I'm going to go to second calc. And once I get to the second calc menu, this is a menu we're going to use a ton of this year. You'll notice actually choice 6 and choice 7 are two things I'm going to use a lot of later on. But tonight, all I want to do is the zero function. And um, once I hit that, the calculator is going to ask me a series of questions. It's going to ask for my, let's say I wanted to go after this zero right here. It's going to ask me for a right bound, and I'd probably put my spider right there and hit enter. Or no, that would be my left bound, I'm sorry. And then the right bound, I'm going to move the spider down here, hit enter. Then it wants me to guess, and I'm just going to move my mouse or that spider as close as I can to the root, hit enter. And when I did that, I got a value of x equals 0.765, approximately. Notice I'm going three decimals, all right? And because there is uh, some beautiful symmetry going on, I got uh, the other, I had to start all over, went back to second calc, did zero again, and that root right there was x equals negative 0.765, and I'm just going to construct a nice sign chart here, and the picture is going to tell me everything I need to know, uh, negative 0.7, oops, 0.765, getting a little sloppy here, 0.765. Second derivative. Now you'll notice I kind of I've disregarded the denominator, but that's guaranteed to be a positive value. Okay, so dividing by a positive isn't going to change anything. And what you're seeing here is a bunch of negatives because it's below, and then I've got a bunch of positives because we're above, and then I got a bunch more negatives right in there. Boom, boom, boom. And so what we just confirmed is that y is concave down, then concave up, and then concave down. And we do have po two points of inflection because y double prime or f double prime changed signs. So I hope you're able to follow. I hope you uh, feel pretty confident with your calculator skills. Let's take those three new rules for uh, driving the inverse functions and commit them to memory. And we'll rock and roll tomorrow.